Take your Bible, turn to 1 Peter, if you would, please. 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter, uh, chapter 2 is where we are. 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, <clears throat> in the next couple weeks, you know, as long as it takes me to get through a portion of Scripture, uh, I'm not going to give an exact date. But uh, I want you to be praying and thinking. Any time that I deal with issues related to the home, related to families, uh, related to the role of men and women, uh, I'm always respectful. I really am. I, I try not to kid around too much about it. Um, when it comes to the role of men and the role of women in the church. And... Um, I've, I've dealt with this before, it's just fall along the line of scripture, we're in 1 Peter, and that's what's coming up next, if you read 1 Peter chapter 3, then you kind of understand uh, what I'm saying, but God has areas that he has put every one of us in, God made some of you men, God made some of you women, I can't explain how God decided who gets what, but that's how God picked us, God picked some men, some women, and so on, I never ever want to to be guilty of, of uh, degrading womanhood. Because I don't think it's right. I don't think it's biblical. I think God gives women an honor and a blessing that is something that men will never get. And, and basically that is through childbearing. To me, childbearing is one of the greatest things that a species can do in this world is bring forth fruit now, I don't care if you're a grape or a woman. Uh, to me, it's the greatest thing. The church is always pictured as a woman in the Bible. And as such, God has designed us to bring forth much fruit, just as he has a woman. Uh, it can be said that Christ uh, is the greatest man of all. And there's no doubt about that. But he was born from a woman, and that speaks volumes. And so when I get into that, I'm going to be speaking from the Bible. I'm going to be teaching you what the Bible says about it. And I've just learned when it comes to those roles, it's best to want God's best in your life. Whether you're a man, you're a woman, or a child, or if, you are, if there's a realm of authority, if you are in authority, there's one responsibility. If you're under authority, there's another responsibility. And God works it all out. So just be praying about that. Some people just get... I, did, they just, I can tell you this, I, can, I definitely know that it's easier to preach this now in this church than it has been in times past, without a doubt. And that goes all the way back to as long as I've been here. So just be praying about that, all right? Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, let's go uh, verse 21, we'll move down to verse 20. I know it's supposed to be dealing with the chief, the, the chief shepherd, the bishop, and so on. But this caught my eye tonight. And uh, just going to touch on it real quick and move on. First uh, Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. If, you've ever, if you ever read books aside from the Bible, there's one that I recommend. I had not read it in a long time. And you may not have heard of it, but it was called In His steps you know what i'm talking about i mean this goes way back if you how many have read that book okay really is that in your wow cool okay um i recommend it and it's based upon this right here with follow follow his steps and walk in his steps and so on and i just like i say i just recommend if you can get your hands on a copy it's not a very big book is it from what i remember uh, but anyway, it basically gives the story of a town or a church when everybody decided that they were going to do what the phrase, what would Jesus do, came from that particular book. And people were making decisions now for the first time in their life, even though they've been in church, making decisions now to do only what Christ would do or Christ would say in any given circumstance and so on. So I just want to encourage you for that. Now, verse 22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. That still means that your Bible's right 100% of the time. Amen? It's never wrong. It's never going to be wrong. It's not ever to been found wrong. Verse 23, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. Write that down somewhere. 
and look at it every now and then. When you're reviled, do not revile back. When a guy drives past you, flipping you off, giving you the horn and everything else, don't give him another one back. That's what it means. Don't revile people back. Sometimes it's best to take and to lose one argument, you'll gain a lot more in eternity. Amen? There's something to be said about biblical Christian meekness. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is the ability to shut your mouth and keep it shut when it should be shut. Meekness doesn't try to win all the arguments. Sometimes it's just best to let stupid people talk and finish and just say, I couldn't add any more to that. Okay? And just, and just let them go. But anyway, who was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. Jesus did not tell any of those Roman soldiers, you hit me one more time, I want to get you. Or, you just wait till I come back. Not a word. Not a word. Okay? That may not have been how some of us were raised. That may not have been how we were taught. That may not have been the neighborhood we grew up in was rough and tough and we had to fight our way through. I'm just saying, here's what the Bible says. When you're reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that does what? Judgeth righteously. Okay? Husbands and wives, it's better to let God judge who's right and who's wrong so you don't fight. Okay? I'm, I'm real big about not fighting in front of your children. I'm, I'm big on that. Don't let your children see instability in the home. It has an effect on them. How many of y'all know that? Say amen. There's people that grew up in rough homes, unstable homes, fights going on, arguing, screaming, cursing, throwing things. People, children growing up in houses right now have no idea how, how their life is going to turn out from one day to the next. Okay? Let it not be said that that takes place in a Christian home or one that claims to be. Okay? Uh, you commit yourself to God, let God judge in the argument, and God will God will always pick the right one. And he'll humble people and he'll bless people. All right? And let God have it. Verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we... Let me stop right here. The Bible says that... Uh, I'm going to paraphrase because I, I don't have it exactly word for word memorized. But it, it goes along the lines of a man would barely... Give his life for people that he knew and loved. And yet Christ, who none of us were his friends, none of us were close to his side, none of us were in his bosom. Christ died for people that hate his guts. Christ died for people that he didn't, he didn't have to die for them. He did not, he was not bound by, by some family tree to die for whoever, whatever. That was not in the deal. He died for people that he loved and he cared about, even though those people were not going to love him back. He died for those people. He bare their sins. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay? So, the question you could ask, it's a legitimate question. Would you be willing to do something would you be willing to bless someone who had just cursed you? Would you be willing to give something to someone who had stolen from you? And that's tough with me, because I don't like thieves, okay? It just, it, it, thievery doesn't make sense. It's easier to go out and work a job than it is to w do what some guys do, have to get in the house and, and, and steal stuff. It just doesn't make sense to me. But... Would you be willing to give $100, $200, $1,000 to someone who had just stole from you because they needed drug money? Okay? Would you be willing to do that for somebody? Would you be willing to bless someone 
who you knew hated you? Would you be willing to lay down for someone and take a beating from someone who had decided they was going to beat you? These are things that may sound ridiculous, but all of these things are exactly what Christ did for us 2,000 years ago. He did it willingly. He was, he was, he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord, find another way. I'm all for it. He had decided, Christ decided before he ever left heaven that he was going to serve God, he was going to do it by the book, that he was going to, he was going to, um, he was going to do what his father commanded him to do, and that was going to be the end of it. And even when his flesh mind had questions about it, when he knew his flesh didn't want to go forward with it, Christ knew that he was bound by his love for his father, and he's bound by his love for you and I to do exactly for us what neither one of us deserved to have done for us. We've stole, we've murdered people in our mind, we've done atrocious things, both outwardly and inwardly to other people, and we've done those same things to God, and yet Christ died for us willingly. When he, by the time he laid down on that cross, he was committed, never changed his mind one bit. They even mocked him and said, if you be the Son of God, why don't you come down from there? Why don't you command angels to come down and pick you off of there? And he never did it one time. But he bare our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness by his stripes, ye were healed. So let's say that since Christ came, I'm going to make up a number. I'm going to say 35 billion people have lived on this earth since Christ came and died. 35 billion people, okay? That may be low, that may be high, may be dead on, I don't know. Out of those 35 billion people, how many are going to heaven? Very small portion. So let's say that it's a billion out of the 35 billion. A billion people is going to go to heaven. That means 34 billion people. Christ died for them and he loved them unconditionally and was willing to bear their sins on his body when he hung on the cross. He was willing to agonize and suffer for them unjustly. They did not deserve it. And they have no intention of ever receiving it, ever trusting in it, ever asking for it, and ever loving God back. Okay? Lost cause? Not in God's eyes. Not in God's eyes. In the world we live in today, it's hard to love people. It's hard to love people. It's hard to love people in our own homes sometimes. It's hard to love people in church. It is hard to love people that's in our own families, blood families, blood relatives. It's hard to love them. Much less loving people down at the gas station, loving people on the highway, loving people that you work for or work with or who work under you. Loving people in government. That's our, that's, that was the big talk in the office tonight was Joe brought up the... FBI memo email deal. Him and Sterling was, did y'all get that all hashed out? I was going to take notes on it so I can send them off to Washington and have it put in place, but there are people in Washington, D.C., and I'm going to be dead honest with you, there are people in Washington, D.C. that I hate. I hate who they are. I hate what they represent. I hate what comes out of their mouth. I hate what they do. Okay? And there's a borderline. Do I actually hate them enough to want to see them dead and go to hell? I can't answer that in my flesh. Okay? So it's tough. Do we love people enough to sacrifice? Including people that if you were to ask us to be honest with, we'd say, no, I don't, I care nothing for them. Do we love people enough to want them to go to heaven? Do we love people who have done terrible things to this country maybe irreversible things you was talking about what's going on in washington steve i'm afraid some of that stuff's irreversible i'm afraid that some things have gone so far and never be fixed okay there's not going to be a law come out of the white house that's going to revoke sodomy in this nation okay i think it's gone too far but is it okay to love sodomites 
it all right to pray for them? Is it all right to hope that they get saved? Is it all right to pray for politicians who are so diametrically opposed to everything that we stand for and believe in that they are literally our enemies? There's no doubt about it. They are enemies to this nation. They're enemies to the Constitution. As far as I'm concerned, they're enemies to the Bible. They're enemies to God's grace. Okay? Christ died for them. Christ died for them. And I'm saying tonight, I had no idea I was going to talk about this. This is the kind of way that God, God's taken it. I think that at some point we need to restore Christian love back to Christianity. Okay? I am, I'm hip deep in politics. Okay? But preachers don't make good politicians. Because we see everything in absolutes. Okay? And the very nature of politics is compromise. Okay? I am not a politician. I don't like it. I don't like politics. And so I, I don't know. I'm just saying tonight that it's okay to restore Christian love back to Christianity where it belongs. Because if we don't love people, who is? If we don't love sinners, who's going to love them? If we don't love people that's done things that are wrong, who's going to love them? If we don't give to people who need giving to, whether they deserved it or not, who's going to give to them? Who's going to help people that needs help, whether they deserve the help or not? I didn't deserve the help that I've gotten. I've not deserved one sermon that I've ever preached that blessed anybody. I've not deserved anything that I've ever done for the Lord. I deserve none of it. And yet it was given freely to me by a God who loves me a whole lot more than I love other people. Being honest. Amen? So, what would be, we be willing to sacrifice for the sake of other people that they would be saved or that they could be blessed or they could be benefited in even a small way as how you and I have been blessed and been benefited. Amen? You know, they say that liberals are liberals because they're rich and they have a guilt complex because they have so much money they feel like that something should be done to give to other people. And their problem is they include everybody in on the giving when it's their guilt, let them give. Amen? Well, I kind of understand that a little bit. I've been given 30 and a half years of marriage. That's not typical nowadays. I have a job that I've been able to keep now for the last 24 years. I didn't deserve it. I have children that love me. They also get a paycheck from me too, just saying. Just, you know. But I have children that love me. I have grandchildren that think the world of me. And I get phone calls from people and emails saying, Pastor, we love you. And I don't know where in the world what I did to earn any of it. Okay? So in a way, I'm rich and I feel guilty. And I feel like I want to give more than what I'm already giving. I want to do more than what I'm doing. Because there's a lot more people out there that could use a hand. Can I hear God's people say amen? Amen. By your stripes you were healed. His stripes. We were healed. Which takes stripes for somebody. My sister and I, I love you sis, I hope you're listening. In all the years with us growing up, we were notorious for turning one another in. Or, if we didn't turn each other in, we were going to hold it over their head. Okay? I don't think I ever took a whipping from my sister voluntarily. I don't think I ever said, Sis, uh uh, I can't let mom find out you did this. I'll make her think I did it. Okay? I never done that for my sister. Okay? But I'd do it now. Okay? And I'd do it for each one of you. And we ought to be willing to do it for one another. Okay? Did, she des did I deserve every whipping I got? Yes, and then some. Amen? But Christian love is that we're willing to take something that is against somebody else and take it on ourselves 
and pay their penalty. That's what Christian love is. That's what it's all about. So you take what God just told because it came, didn't come from me tonight. I promise you, I did not spend all day studying this one. Okay? All right. Let's, let's go to this. Take your Bible turn to John chapter 19. Jesus is the head. He's the chief. He's the boss. He's the top of every position and everything in this world. He's preeminent in all things. And there's one thing that he is better than any of us, and that is he is the man. He is the man. Okay? When you read in your Bible about Adam, you're reading about a higher Adam, a better Adam, a second Adam, a different Adam, the different man. John chapter 19, verse 5, Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns, and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. Out of all the men that's ever walked in this earth and ever will walk in this earth, Jesus is the highest man of them all. None of us men would ever be able... John, what did John say about Jesus' shoes? I'm not even worthy to loose his shoe latchet. He is the man, okay? And I'm not even worthy as a man to even touch the hem of his garment. That's how great he is as the man. 1 Corinthians eleven three. 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. All of us men, we're not the boss. We're not the chief. We're not the big dog. Whatever role a man is to fulfill in his life, whether it's as husband or as father, or as grandfather or patriarch or as that house fixer or what does the word husband mean? Does anybody remember? Huh? House band. The man, the husband holds together the house. Men, we will fail at it. We will not succeed at it. We will ruin our responsibility as house band. Because while that role in itself requires holding it together for the family, we ourselves sometimes are just coming apart at the seams, like an old baseball. Christ, however, is the house band men when you find that you're not holding it together real well bring christ in bring jesus the man in he can hold your family together a lot better than you can on any day and twice on sunday amen the head of every man is christ the head of the woman is who the man look at what it says the man that's why I chose this verse, because it says, the man. So you get your King James Pure Bible Search software out, type in, what? The man. And there it is, right there. Now think about it in this context. The head of the woman is who? The, say it, the man. Don't be like Fonzie and stutter, you know, when you, I was wrong. He is the man. The head of every woman is the man. The church is the woman. Amen? The church is the woman. There is a man for the woman. And the man is Christ. The church does not boss the Lord around. We did not give Jesus our Bible. And say, here's the rules. Sonny boy, you want to get along in this family, you're going to have to follow our rules. That's not what we did. We received His Word from heaven. We are the wife. He is the man. When He says do, we're supposed to be doing. But you know what, guys? Jesus is a lot better man than us. You know why? He'll listen to His wife. Both ears. Amen? And when His wife, the church, is not in a good mood... And we're complaining. 
He'll listen to us every time. Who in here has ever play, prayed a prayer of complaint to Jesus? Raise your hand. Whined and fussed and complained and was mad and angry and spiteful and, I mean, just fur, couldn't take it anymore. And you're just letting God have it. And then it's something that God did not take a besom of destruction and sweep you up with it. You know why? He's a better man. He's the man that can listen to the wife, the woman, the church, gripe, fuss, moan, complain, take it out on him, and he'll take it every single time. And he'll do it with great compassion and great love because that's his wife, that's his bride. And he does it because he loves her. Man that don't love his wife, as soon as, she's, as soon as she starts in, he's out, he's in another room, he's gone, he's going to go down to the tavern, or he's going to go visit his whore somewhere or whatever. That's a man that don't love his wife. A man that loves his wife will sit there and listen. And he'll take it, and he'll let her talk. He'll let her get it out. And then he'll take her... It's Jesus now, this is what he's doing. He's, he'll take us and he'll hold us and he'll love us and he'll say, don't worry, I got it. You see, the wife is called in the Bible the weaker vessel. Now you think about that. In the nature of Christ and the church, who then is the stronger vessel? It's Christ. He, we really are the weaker vessel. We cannot bear the load that he bears. So what did he say? Cast all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. And then he said to us, who is the wife, the bride, the woman, he says, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Isn't that what he said? Because we as the wife, the bride, we can't carry what he carries. We weren't designed to, we weren't meant to. Great, great lesson I've learned in life is that oftentimes I am carrying my own burdens and I've got my own yoke upon myself. I'm yoked to things of this world. I'm yoked to problems. I'm yoked to this and I'm yoked to that. And then when I remember, take my yoke upon you, cast your cares upon me. And when I flip that around, I always find that yes, Christ's yoke is a lot easier to bear. He takes it on himself. I mean, just think about the nature of it. Okay? God's given us men, the shoulders, the muscle mass, the, the bone density, which means hard-headed. Okay? But it also means, physically, men were designed to carry greater loads than women were. Take that, Gloria Steinem. Take that, Hillary Clinton and all you... Nasty liberal women who want to liberate women from the dominion of evil men. No, 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 no. It's just better when you do it God's way. Amen? And as the church, if we let Christ be the man and let him bear the responsibility, we will find it a lot easier. A lot easier. Amen? The, woman, the head of the woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. So, church, you're part of this church, but you're part of the church of Jesus Christ. Whatever burdens that we may have in this church, whatever needs we may have, who's better to meet those needs? Not us. It's Jesus Christ. Without a doubt. Come, can I hear somebody say amen? First Corinthians, thank you. Appreciate that. Listen, God's going to raise up some young people just going to, overshadow you old people and go amen amen first corinthians eleven seven. for a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of god now think about this we do not wear our caps inside the house of god we don't leave them on when we pray either do we nor we don't i would love i would love to be upstairs in my little room up there doing pmos all day long wearing a hat i like wearing a hat my wife don't like me wearing a hat i like wearing a hat but you know, I can't wear one. Because I got the Word of God, 
and I'm giving the word of God out, that is me prophesying, and it is not right for me to wear a hat and prophesy the word of God. Now, I'm not 100% sure exactly why. When I get to heaven, I'll ask God. But until then, until I know, I'm just going to do what God said. You're not going to see me wearing a hat trying to preach to people. Amen? So, he said, For a man indeed ought not cover his head, for as much as he's the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of who? Say it. The man. That's how I picked this verse. The man. Think about it now. The church is the glory of who? Jesus Christ. Not our own glory. This is why when Sister Eunice goes back to Kenya, we all ought to get on a plane and go back with her. We're going to come with you out to Katali Town, and we're going to see that in Kenya, they don't have churches with $4 million buildings. They've got poles set up, 10 walls, 10 roof, and a pulpit made out of wood, and they preach the word of God, and people are saved. Amen? Because that church recognizes. It's something we've lost in America. In America, the church wants to be pretty and draw everybody to the church. That ain't right. That's like the woman adorning herself and her husband's watching her going, she ain't doing that for me, is she? He knows what's going on. So that church adorns herself and tries to make her look, herself look pretty so that she draws and attracts the world to her. And that's not how Jesus said to do it. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So in Kenya... They don't have million dollar churches. They have a church. Meets in a little place. And the glory that's in there. Is the glory of Jesus Christ. And not the glory. Of what that church building looks like. Or how great those people are inside that church. If they come in God's house with no shoes on, it's because they don't own a pair of shoes. Amen? The glory then, I'll never, I will never forget. I've got to tell you the story. We were in um, Kilimanjaro, me and Pastor Hutzel, and there was a woman there. This, this church, I love this church. I hope we get to go back in August. But this, this church, this, there was a woman there. And she had come to the meeting. I don't know if she'd ever been there before, but she wasn't part of this church, any other churches that were there. And she was there, and she didn't have a real pretty dress on like some of the other women had. And she didn't have a pair of shoes. She didn't have anything else. She wasn't supposed to get a Bible, but I noted that she got a Bible anyway. We didn't fuss and complain about it. And that pastor, bless his heart, he stood her, I don't know if he stood her up in front of everybody, but he noted her and he said, people, this woman here, she needs a pair of shoes. Who will bring a pair of shoes tomorrow to God's servant? People went, we'll bring her a pair of shoes. He said, she hasn't had her hair fixed in quite a while. How many of you ladies would get together and fix her hair and wash it real nice and make her look real pretty like you got your hair? And several ladies went, we'll do that. And he said, she doesn't have a dress to wear. It's not, I mean, it's a real old, dirty dress. Who will bring the dear saint of God a dress to wear like some of you other ladies have a dress? Several hands went up. Who will bring this lady and her children some food to eat so they'll have food tomorrow? Hands went up. And I just wept. I said, God, that's how it's supposed to be. That's how it's supposed to be. Because the glory then goes to the Lord. And it's not on the church. That kind of stuff is God's glory, the glory of the husband, in the house of God, the way it's supposed to be. Ladies, can I hear you say amen? Amen.
The man is not the woman, or not of the woman, the woman is of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Do you see that? You know what that means? The man, the, neither was the man created for the woman. Did you just see the doctrinal statement that's inside that? Jesus is not created. Hey Amen. The woman was. But Jesus is not created. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. I mean, think about it. Here is God looking at Adam, and he says, it is not good for what? The man to be alone. And he wasn't just talking about Adam. He was talking about his son, Jesus Christ. It's not good that my son, the man, should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. Meaning, we are sufficient for the needs of Jesus Christ. You think about that, and you'll feel about this big that God ever picked you. Amen? This cause ought the man, uh, uh, neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man, neither was the, for this cause ought the woman to have power in her head because of the angels. I have no idea what that means. Verse 11. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. But all things of God. Because even Christ had a mother. Amen? Even Christ had a mother. Okay? So, he is... I like this when I'm done. 1 Timothy 2.5 for there is one God and one mediator between God and men. What does it say? The man. Christ Jesus. Mary is not the mediator. No other saint, no other man can be the mediator between us and God. Only the one who is both God and and man, Jesus Christ, can be the one mediator. So I'm going to teach you. Young guys, listen to me. Young people, listen, listen. You know when we pray, Jr., we always pray in Jesus' name. All right? Okay? Should you ever pray, Callie, without using Jesus' name? You think it would be right? You think it would be okay? No? You're right. Never ever pray thinking that you can bypass Jesus and leave him out of your prayers. Never think that. Never do it. Never fall for anybody that tells you it can be done that way. Because you have no right to go before a holy God as a human being, as a man, you have no right to go to God by yourself. You have to go through the mediator, Jesus Christ. So when we pray, we always in this church pray through Jesus we pray, in Jesus we pray, in Jesus' name we pray. Jesus, bear our petitions to the Father. Amen. But Jesus somehow, some way, has got to be in that prayer. Or don't pray it. Pray, pray in Jesus or go home. Okay? Don't leave him out. It's very important. Very important for you to know that. Let's stand to our feet. One of these days, you're going to pray in front of a group of people. And you're going to say, in Jesus we pray, and somebody's going to get offended. Somebody's going to get mad. And they're going to throw you out, or they're going to accuse you of this, or whatever, because you brought Jesus into your prayers. Well, it's better to be thrown out of that group and still have Jesus than to throw out Jesus just to keep the group. God will show you one of these days what that means. You learned it here. You learned it from God. Always take Jesus with you when you pray. Can I hear God's people say amen?